Well, my name is Diego, and I'm a Partner Solutions Architect in AWS, and I will be your speaker today and moderator for this webinar. I also have my friend Eric Johnson, a Cloud Architect from Rackspace, and he's going to be describing how Rackspace uh, helped our customer OFX to move to the cloud. I'm to present today how AWS enables business transformation with cloud migration methodology, process, and tools. And I also describe how partners like Rackspace, they can help you to realize your business transformation. Well, we can start this uh, presentation with, some, uh, with a simple question. Why are companies migrating to the cloud? What's their motivators? And I can point out some of these motivators as uh, increases business agility, because uh, we, when we collect information from our partners post-migration, they realize their workforce have increased on 30 to 70% and being more productive. And by that, they can go to market much faster. And we see a lot of data center consolidation projects, especially in companies that have been active with acquisitions or that have experienced infrastructure sprawl over the years. We also see companies looking to completely reimagine their business by using modern technology as part of a larger digital transformation project. And of course, any cost conscious organization is always looking for ways to improve the bottom line by reducing their costs. So at the same time, we have some motivators to migrate to the cloud. Here we can see some of the challenges that some of you could eventually observe when working on a migration project. And I can list some of these challenges as maybe you already have some existing investments that have been uh, made in your current data centers, as maybe a hardware recycle project or a new storage device you just acquired, and that could be a challenge. Uh, some critical applications that they cannot afford to be down during the migration. Or maybe even skeptical stakeholders, as some of them have never been exposed to the cloud computing benefits. AWS and our partners, we have experience in removing those barriers as uh, on a migration project. And by that, we, do, we share a common migration framework, which is being used to success, successful migrate customers to AWS. It is necessary, though, to build a foundation for a successful cloud migration. And that foundation is composed by the following core components. We all start with a business case. And that business case defines the business drivers and develop a compelling investment justification. Two, we have people in organization because we have to identify new roles and responsibilities during and after the migration. So we have to consider who in our workforce will fill out uh, the identified roles. We also have a methodical migration process. We use a five-step migration process to visualize and plan cloud adoption, from business planning, portfolio evaluation, to application design and migration execution, and finally to cloud operations. And we also share a six common migration strategy to identify patterns into on-premise applications. And by that, this makes it easier to categorize applications so they can be grouped together and migrate to simultaneously uh, to the cloud using the same migration strategy. So uh, in the following, I'm going to present you each one of these components with more details. When it comes to the business case component, it is important to consider the following elements, such as cost analysis, because it evaluates how existing environments and future state costs should be compared into a financial TCO model to demonstrate the financial benefits of moving to the cloud. Uh, we also have the cost of change, because this item can include eventual migration software license or migration consuming hours. And we all know the cloud has a lot of benefits, and one of those is decreased pro productivity. So automation is a key component that can be enabled uh, by using AWS, helping you to reduce the number of hours used to maintain your applications. We also can tell uh, about faster deployment time because uh, the faster you can deploy your software, the faster you can go to market. And therefore, it's important to estimate the return of investment to justify the overall migration case. Uh, on the people and organization component, it is important the creation of a cloud center of excellence, or a CCOE. The CCOE is a team of people responsible for building the best practice, governance, and frameworks that the rest of the organization we use when migrating systems to the cloud. And we can start with the basics, uh, setting up roles and permissions, cost governance, uh, monitoring, incident management, a hybrid architecture, and a uh, security model. And over time, these responsibilities will evolve to including things like multi-account 
management or, or uh, managing gold images, or maybe business units chargebacks and or reusable reference architectures. So we just discussed the two first core components, business plan and people uh, CCOE. Now it's time for the migration methodology core component. It is important to say that the same migration methodology is used by AWS migration specialists and AWS migration partners. The migration process is comprised by these uh, five phases. Uh, phase one is the first thing you should do in a uh, project. It is the migration preparation and business planning. And as we already covered in the previous decks, it is important though to define the scope of the migration on or the success criteria for the migration project as it helps to define the right direction to the next steps. The phase two, it's composed, it's uh, the portfolio discovery and planning. And that at this stage, you should execute a full portfolio analysis of your environment and create a complete map of applications and server interdependencies, as well as a migration strategy and priorities. Those are key elements to build a successful migration plan. And I can tell you one recommendation. You should start, uh, for example, with your less critical and less complex applications because it creates a sound learning opportunity for you to migrate uh, for your migration teams. Phase three, that application design, and phase four, the migration and validation, they are both combined, as we call a migration factory. So here, the focus shifts from portfolio level to the individual application level. And uh, as each application is designed and migrated and validated, uh, we recommend a continuous improvement approach because it's the way the project flows, the lessons learned can help you to accelerate the next migration waves. And finally, uh, operating the new model. Your cloud operating model, uh, when you go to the cloud, is an evergreen set of people, process, and technologies. So as this cont constantly improves, as you migrate more applications, optimize your new foundation, uh, turn off old systems, and constantly iterate, you, uh, you build up your expertise and develop, uh, develop by all the previous migrations, and that enables you to develop a new foundation that leads to a continually improving operating model. When you design your application uh, migration strategy, each application might have different requirements. So it is important to classify the migration strategy using one of these six migration paths. The first migration path is uh, rehost. We also call that as a lift and shift migration. So we're moving servers and applications to the cloud exactly the way they are. We can automate that with tools like AWS Migration Service, or maybe you prefer to do this manually. So as you learn how to apply your legacy systems to the new uh, cloud platform. The second migration, op migration option is to re-platform. And you can make some few cloud optimizations without changing the core architecture of your application. I can give you one example, like you can reduce the amount of time you spend managing database instance by migrating to Amazon Relational Database, uh, or RDS. The third option would be to repurchase. So uh, it, this model is used when you're buying a new solution or you're moving to a different solution. And that likely means that your organization is willing to change the existing licensing model that has been used. And one example is maybe you decide to move to a SaaS solution instead of managing servers, or maybe you're buying a new solution. So that would be classified under repurchase. And a uh, fourth option is to refactor. So basically you're transforming your legacy application. This one is driven by a business needs and uh, to add features or to scale or to improve performance that uh, otherwise would be difficult using your existing data center. And basically here we are uh, rewriting your code to be more cloud friendly. And we also have two other options that are not necessarily migrated to AWS, but they should also be considered. Uh, Fifth option is to retain. And sometimes there are some applications that are not ready to move to the cloud. Or maybe your business requires the application to be closer to your business as a remote location with poor internet connectivity, for example. So if your workloads requires hybrid environment, AWS also has tools to support that as AWS Direct Connect, VPN, or Storage Gateway. And the last case is to retire. So after you finish your portfolio discovery analysis, you're not going to be surprised that eventually you have some IT assets that are no longer useful and you can just turn them off. And meaning that you can focus your migration only on resources that are widely used. 
So migration projects, they can be complex, but AWS can assist you on different ways. We have AWS APN partners like Rackspace. They have a lot of experience on these migration projects. We also have AWS professional services. They offer a migration practice, and that's in collaboration with our partners. We also have Marketplace, uh, AWS Marketplace. It offers a collection of 30 part tools specialized in migration to AWS, covering the discovery or more workload mobility or post migration optimization. And uh, AWS has also some native tools like AWS migra Server Migration Services or AWS Database Migration Services or Migration Hub. And these uh, are some of the options where AWS can help you to accelerate your migration. And now I hand it back over to Eric. All right, thanks, Diego. Uh, really good information. When you're dealing with migration, and I know it, it, when you're at the very beginning, it can be very daunting, it can be very over overwhelming. What's really encouraging and good to see is that AWS has a plan. They've got a roadmap that help customers constantly move from an on-premise or hybrid or something like that into uh, AWS. Uh, and Rackspace comes along and, and follows that plan, works with that plan, and helps uh, you know customers implement those kind of plans. And this is one example we did with a company called OFX. Now, a little bit about me. Uh, again, my name is Eric Johnson. I am a uh, cloud architect uh, at Rackspace. I'm also the public cloud evangelist, so I get to talk about public cloud quite a bit. I'm a huge fan of AWS, have been for a long time. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna jump in and and get started here and talk about OFX. All right, OFX, and I've got uh, some technical issues. Give me one second here. There we go. OFX is, the, is a global currency uh, company. The global currency experts at OFX help individuals and organizations transfer money internationally. So they, you know, they, they do this payment processing and help transfer money back and forth, dealing with currency exchange and different things like that. Since launching, they've, they've transferred over $100 billion or 100 billion units, uh, depending on where you're at, across 55 currencies and 190 countries. They are headquartered in Australia. And they've been doing this for two decades. Um, so they, so they're, they're kind of experts at this. But what they found is they, as, as they were growing, they were running into some issues. And we're going to talk about that and how Rackspace was able to help them uh, also implementing AWS. So the challenge that they had, uh, first of all, is rapid infrastructure growth. They're growing very fast. Their, their product is actually white labeled and used elsewhere. And so they were growing very fast, specifically in their database. And we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Uh, but it was also introducing, because of this growth, they're introducing single points of failure. The second issue that they were having, or the challenge they were having, was their environment co-location. What that meant is they were hosting their product environment uh, in a place where they didn't have immediate access. Uh, and so this introduced issues um, in, in doing change process. Uh, and finally, inconsistent environments. And that kind of stems off the second one. Well, you have this where, where we were able to make, you know, um, cha make changes on our, on our development and maybe our staging and our beta and things like that, but making changes to production was tougher. So what eventually happens, we have this inconsistency between the different environments from where we were testing to where we were doing uh, actual production. So let's break that down a little bit. We're gonna look at the before picture. First thing I wanna talk about is database. Now, the database architecture that they had is they had basically this massive database uh, in their production environment, and they had some read replicas. So they were able to replicate that out and, and read, but what ended up happening is you had this kind of single point of failure of a single database that you know all these white label websites were reliant on. And the growth that they were experiencing in at OFX, it was such that they had maxed out this machine. This was a, this was a you know bare metal hardware, and they had maxed it out. They it had is you know, the fastest processors they could put in. It had the most RAM, and so so what we call vertical scaling. They had scaled it as far as they could. Okay, so the other part of that is because because this idea of this third party co-location they 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 were running some local data analysis and they were having problems getting data to the development environment to run this analysis so this breakdown of communication between where they were housing where they were doing their development environments and their production environment was causing issues uh for the data analysis that they were doing 
So the second thing that we were looking at is, again, we talked about this difference of environment. And so really what that looked like is in, in our development environment, we had a certain setup and, and we were able to change it easily. Uh, you know, even, even with change process, you know, being in place, so we were able to make these changes to our development environment, but we weren't able to do it on our production environment. Right. So what you end up doing, and, and this is if you're a developer, you've heard this before, this idea of, hey, it worked on my desk. And that may be true. But because of environmental changes, there was a lot of times when uh, it, it wouldn't work in production. And so so they ran into issues with that um, and, and really added a lot of complication to to the release process. Another part of this uh, was their disaster recovery setup. Their disaster recovery setup, again, hosted in third party uh, co-location, was not set up to handle the load they were taking. This, this goes back to that huge growth in infrastructure, right? And so what they were looking at is, you know, massively scaling the production, but their disaster recovery wasn't there. And they knew that there was a risk of data loss here. And so this is something that needed to be mitigated. In the before picture, their performance was also uh, hurting. Now, there's a couple things that were leading to this. One, they had virtual machine-based proxy and routing via Nginx. Now, this does not in any way say that using Nginx is, is bad. No, actually, actually, Nginx is a great product. But they weren't utilizing it properly. And really, that came down to a skill set within the company. They, 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 they had configured it was running, but, but there were some configurations that issues that were going on, number one, that was causing problems, and two, because of the multiple machines and the multiple play points of editing, there was some inconsistencies between the configurations. They were also seeing this in their VM-based cache, which they were using Redis, the same kind of issues in, in having to maintain them and, and do management at, at multiple points. And so they were running into a difference, you know, there's a delta between what it looked on one machine and what it looked like on another, which was causing uh, pretty severe performance issues. And the last major thing in the before picture was security. So their architecture was such that each of their servers had a public IP. Now that's not inherently bad if you use the you know, if you if you set up your firewalls and and you, and you really lock that down, but it, it's risky because. You have this multiple points of management again, uh, and and it's easy to miss something. So so you have all these machines that are publicly available, and that 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 kind of opens up your blast radius a little bit. So that's kind of what their before picture looked looked like. So what they realized is they had a need, right? They had a need for two things. One, they needed cloud technology. They needed to be able to do you know what the cloud provides, and two, they needed a managed service provider. They needed someone to come in and come alongside them to work with them. So what did that look like? So first of all, for cloud technology, here's what they recognize they need. Number one, they needed cloud technology for the scalability that it offered. Like I said before, they were having these massive uh, things that, that are, you know, they had this massive scale that was going on, massive growth, and they needed to be able to scale with that. They also needed unfettered access to all environments. They need to be able to get to their production. They need to be able to set up, set up a, a pipeline in such a way or a change process in such a way that whatever changes they made in development environments happened also in production. So they kept those matching. They needed to be able to, along those same lines, have the ability to have consistent infrastructure across all environments. Um, and, and so really that, you know, like I just said, they, really that came down to how do we how do we set it up so that if I make a change in development, it's going to propagate to staging, it's going to propagate to production. So really they needed, and you, you've heard this idea, they needed infrastructure as code. They needed to be able to version their infrastructure and manage that. They needed the ability to, again, like it's a consistent, also reproducible is what we would add to that. Uh, so so we can, what, whatever we do for one, we can reproduce to the other. They need the ability to scale to global regions. They couldn't just stay in a, in a data center in Australia. They needed to be able to, I mean, they're dealing with, with worldwide global transfers. They need to be able to, to be, be where that's happening. And they needed a new disaster recovery plan. They needed to have a cloud, cloud technology or, or provider that could, that could provide a good uh, DR plan uh, and infrastructure. For a managed service provider, they needed a provider with deep knowledge of databases, specifically for them, MSSQL. They knew they were they had, they had an issue they needed to deal with. They were growing beyond the limits of what their infrastructure could handle. They needed a provider with deep knowledge of AWS. Obviously, they you know we're going to go on AWS. But we don't want to get someone else who barely knows it. We want to have someone who knows it really well. They wanted credibility in the industry. 
they wanted to hear from someone who who you know who deals with with a large portion of the of the fortune 100 companies someone who has a track record for management for partnering uh and for for aws uh, expertise uh and they and they wanted a provider that worked as a partner and I, and I throw this out because there are sometimes there's providers that provide a service and there's partners that come in and, and provide that service while they walk alongside you and help you and that's how rackspace works so look at let's look at why they chose aws so they offer managed services one of the big things is this this managed service idea we want to get out from under managing our own database and managing this cash and, and load balances, things like that. So that was critical. They wanted a company that could offer these managed services that took that load off them. They wanted a company that could offer tooling that created reproducible environments. Uh, AWS CloudFormation fits that bill you know, very well. That's like AWS CloudFormation is going to allow them to to you know create uh, infrastructure as code and then move that out. And they wanted a, a provider that had or or a public cloud that had global infrastructure. You know with 18 gra geographic regions, uh, you know 54 availability zones. AWS is where they you know where where OFX needed to be. AWS was or is, so they're able to use that. So why they chose Rackspace as, an, as their audited AWS managed service provider? Number one, Rackspace has a history of managing pr uh, production environments for thousands of companies. We have that credibility they were looking looking for. Rackspace, gui we guided OFX in migration uh, in migrating their their application portfolio to AWS. We have AWS expertise, uh, and that shows uh, in you know when you look at our certifications, over a thousand certifications within our within our company, uh, and we use that expertise. Uh, and application and database management to help move them beyond migration and take full advantage of the flexibility and resiliency of the cloud. So that's why they that's why they chose Rackspace and, and the, the proposal that we made. So let's look at the process of how Rackspace does that. And you saw a lot how how AWS lays out this process for migrating to the cloud, uh, and Rackspace follows that. You know that's 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 a well proven, well well oiled machine that works. And so here's here's how we work on that. So we break this down into six components. First is planning, the second is analyzing, the third is design, migrate, manage, and optimize, as, as you know you see right here. And how that works is we will come in, we will sit down, we will make a plan. Before we ever put any code out, we will make a plan that says, here's, here's how we think, here's the team you're gonna need, here's the expertise that we're gonna provide, here's what we're gonna need from you. A lot of times companies come in and go, well, we don't know where to start. And, and, and maybe maybe a provider comes in and says, well, here's what we're going to do. Well, we still don't know what to do. So we come in and we really help you understand, all right, here's here's where we start and here's what we expect from you. Here's what we're going to provide from you and here's how this works well. We analyze. We go in and we analyze your workloads. We, we look at what you're working with from, from obviously a technical aspect, from an architectural aspect, uh, from a business aspect, and we help you analyze what where you are now. I think one of the big battles is a lot of people don't know what they have sometimes. So there's this idea of understanding where you're starting before you can figure out where you're going. So we help you figure out where you're starting. And then we set up and design, we design that. So we walk through and, and we, um, we will do, you know, we will design architecture, we will design test, you know, plan or test plans. We will design schedules uh, to, to sit down and show you here's the best way to do that. And then we actually do the migration. So and that migration breaks down to a few things that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but then that follows up. So a lot of times when you get on the cloud, okay, good luck. Uh, but that's not how Rackspace works. We come in afterwards and we manage. We help you manage your cloud infrastructure on a daily basis. We're the 24-7 eyes on screen that, uh, you know, that, that we get to call at 3 in the morning and you don't. Uh, so... But then the last thing is we do optim we help with optimization. And optimization, and I love this icon because it's 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 this idea of that is a continual process. When you go through migration, it breaks down uh, you know, in into this this you know, migrating and then optimizing and then transforming. And it's this idea of never stop in, you know in, um, improving on your architecture. Never stop taking advantage of, of, of the services that are, that are being produced. Uh, the, the joke when I when I speak publicly, I do a lot of speaking for AWS is they've got a new service every seven seconds. 
That's not true. Don't quote me on that. But that's how it feels sometimes. And that's a good thing. They're always thinking of better ways to do something. They, their uh, ability to, uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, scale of the way they invent and they, and they produce uh, is always something that you need to be aware of. And Rackspace helps you be aware of that you can look at how can I be doing this better. So that's what the optimized looks like. All right, so so here's how that kind of looked, right? So in, in planning and analysis, Rackspace worked with, works with OFX to understand the current co-located environment, right? So we understood, we did, we did a lot of application discovery with them, and we did a lot of database discovery. You know, what, wh how are you running, how, you, how are you doing this? We helped them discover, you know, the single points of failure. We helped them discover, you know, a, a better way to do that. We also helped them discover that they were probably on, a, on a, a SQL license that they really didn't need. And I'm not saying we moved them out of SQL, but they were on enterprise. And really, in evaluating how they were doing it, we were able to save them money by saying, you know what? You don't need enterprise. There are some changes that can be done that will bring you back down to standard. Uh, and, and that's pretty big cost savings when you look at a licensing. So in the design process, uh, Rackspace helps OFX design a realistic migration plan. This word realistic, I think, is important here. Because realistically, you know, it, it'd be great to sit down and go, if you do this, 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 you know, and go on for, you know, many this is, then you would work great in the cloud. And a lot of times it's like, okay, that's just not realistic. I can't get all that done before I move to the cloud. There's also who just say, you know, let's just lift it and shift it. You heard that term earlier when Diego was talking about it. Pick it up exactly it is, as it is and drop it over. Well, that's not the best use of the cloud. So what we're able to do is help with a realistic plan that says, let's do these things before we move, because that makes sense, but let's do these things after we migrate, right? And so there's this plan of saying, let's knock out A, B, and C, let's migrate over, and then we'll move on to D, E, and F, right? So with that, that you know, looks at, well, number one, infrastructure is code. You know, that's the first thing we did is, look, before we move over, we need to get your infrastructure into a code base, meaning cloud formation. Right, so we get that in there, and, and we use CloudFormation to, to get your infrastructure where it's reproducible, where it'll look the same regardless of where you launch it. Uh, architectural improvements, here's, here's architectural improvements to, to take advantage of. One, a big one for OFX was RDS. Getting off the self-managed or MS SQL database and getting to a, a, uh, a, the RDS. So uh, helping with test plans and timeframes as I talked about before. All right, so here's the actual migration. Here's how we took it with, with them. And this is obviously very simplified uh, after we've gone through this plan. But the first thing we did is we created non-production environments on AWS, created all the, all the environments they needed to do their development and testing and, and just you know, dip their toes into AWS and understand how it works. The second step after the analysis of, uh, of, of you know, the database, we knew that we needed to migrate them from MySQL Enterprise to MySQL Standard, and we needed to move it to RDS. So that was not an easy process. It, we, we actually had one of our guys, one of our database experts on premise for quite a while, helping them understand how can we uh, work this in, and this is an pro serve offering, and how can we take their database and migrate it from Enterprise to Standard to save that licensing costs, and, which is pretty substantial, and, 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 you know, and obviously then migrate into RDS. So once that was done, then the third step was we create the production environment on AWS. So going back to step one, we've already done all the infrastructure as code. So step three was actually pretty simple. It's literally running that same code base again, but using production variables instead of um, instead of you know, development or staging. So that's kind of what the migration looked like in, in very easy steps. And so let me show you the after picture of what that comes out to. So this, first of all, I want to say this is not an, an absolutely accurate um, architectural because that wouldn't all fit. This is a representation for sure, but I wouldn't say this is, you know, this this is an exact replica of the architecture. But let me walk you through some of the things that that uh, you know we we may change. First of all, looking at this production environment because it's an AWS, OFX has complete access to this architecture. Now that doesn't mean everybody in OFX. I mean, the janitor doesn't log in and make changes. The you know, and neither does the CEO. <laughs> so what what this is is through through the use of of um, you know security on on AWS, we're able to allow certain people from OFX full or limited access to this access to what they need. 
right? Rackspace follows the limited access model where you you only give someone just enough to what they need. You don't open it all the way up and then lock it down. You you give them just what they need. So we help them with that um, identity and access management um, process that helps them get into to their production. So the first thing is they have access to authorized users. Um, OFX owns these accounts and can deploy at will. So they don't have to go through a change process where it's a call to a colo, it's a planning around people that aren't even really part of the company. They're able to make these changes at will. You know, and, and with a good CI CD pipeline, you in, in access to, to your, your environments, you can, you know, there are companies who who produce uh, releases thousands of times a day, you know, small incremental changes. And so this is kind of opening the door for OFX to do that. The other thing we, that, that was fixed was security. Uh, we removed the IP. You notice that, that in this architecture, there's a private and a public subnet. And if you're not really, um, if, if you don't have a lot of information on AWS or you don't understand the AWS architecture for security, the basic idea here is we use a public subnet and you'll notice there's nothing in there. Right. The only thing that's publicly available is that load balancer. And that load balancer will only allow certain uh, ports to come through to our private uh, database. We also lock down using security groups that only the load balancer can get to these. So that's a that's an added measure of security, but it also simplifies management. So no longer are we dealing with multiple Nginx uh, servers um, that we're having to manage each each you know as individually we're able to manage their proxy service through an application load balancer and this application load balancer allows you know routing based on path mapping there's a lot of power going on here and so but it's one one uh, management point and really that management can be handled in the cloud formation so you make the change in cloud formation you run the change and that happens so that'll that'll be propagated throughout your different uh, environments so that's that's one thing we took you all also notice we're no longer using uh, VM servers for cache we are now using elastic cache which is a managed service that that supports redis or memcache in this particular instance we use redis and so again it goes back to this Managed service that scales on its own, just like the application load balancer, that is, AWS handles the scaling back and forth on that, the same with the managed service. And so this scales back and forth on its own, and they manage it at one point. So it's a single point of management, but no single point of failure. Uh, and so that allows them to, to have cash without you know a ton of management. And then you'll see as we're talking about this uh, RDS as we're using it, and the way it's set up now is you have a master and a slave, which is, we this is what we call multi-AZ um, uh, implementation. And so with that, their database is automatically in multiple uh, availability zones. Meaning they don't have to, if their database goes down, they don't have to freak out to bring it back up. AWS is already going to do that. They're going to roll over to their replicated database in a different AZ. A lot of times it's seamless or a very short gap. And so downtime for them has been greatly reduced, right? So, and, and, and also with scalability, like I talked about with application load balancer being managed and scalable, same with uh, Elastic Cache. SQL is also, uh, I'm sorry, uh, RDS is also scalable in that you can add memory you can add storage you can grow those with literally the click of a button and it doesn't mean downtime in most cases so they've got scalability at all levels now the last scalability um your scalable uh, option we use is the auto scaling group with this we're able to take their instances and we put them into the aws scaling uh service and that keeps it the way this the way the auto scaling works is it keeps at least two instances and it grows based on metrics and that could be cpu that could be traffic it could be any number of metrics or combination of metrics but it allows the instances to be loaded up and and so so it adds in in both the, uh, availability zones or we can add a third or fourth and it allows it to grow in and out. Now that's an important thing to note with, with auto scaling, you get this idea of elasticity, right? So scaling, yeah, we're scaling out to meet load. But the cool thing about auto scaling is when load dies down, let's say at night or, or off season or whatever, it then scales it back in. 
down to the two, which would be you know our minimum amount of servers, or we might have 20 minimum servers. But this idea of elasticity is 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 really incredible when you're thinking efficiency and meeting load and not having to provision for way overload. And that's what we're able to do with ALFX is teach them, look, you don't have to always be provisioned for max load. Instead, you can provision for the load you have right now and your scalability uh, or your elasticity will handle that. So that's that's one of the other things that we, that we handle for them. So the next thing is the non-production environment. So you notice this looks a lot like the production environment. This was critical to OFX. Is that, you know, they're banging their heads against the wall. We need matching environments. And so with this, they were able to say, okay, we ha now have a non-production environment that looks just like our production environment. However, it's scaled down. So it's the same machines, but but it doesn't have to be multi-AZ. It doesn't have, if this goes down, they don't lose money. They might lose some development time. And they may say, you know what, we don't want to lose our development time, so we're gonna we're gonna do this multi-AZ as well. But this is this is a development environment that they that absolutely replicates their production environment at a smaller scale, and that was huge to them. So now, this, so that brings a lot of confidence back to them, uh, and the works on my desk becomes more relevant. So what does that look like? What's the tool we're using for that? So again, I've been talking about this idea of infrastructure as code, and the idea of infrastructure of code really allows you to, you know, store your infrastructure in CloudFormation uh, and, and the ability to say, okay, I'm going to use the same template for every environment, but I'm going to change what's built in that environment based on parameters. You can do conditions, you can do parameters, all kinds of things like that. But with AWS CloudFormation, I can say, hey, it doesn't matter what I'm going to build. I've got my templates here. And that's where Rackspace comes in and helps. We say, look, we'll build those templates for you. We can help you do that. Um, so we come in and we and we use uh, CloudFormation and we build out the different environments as needed. All right. So here's the takeaway. Here's what, when we go back and talk to OFX and say, what do you think? How did it help? Well, you know, what what are you thinking of? This is this is what we get back. So they said, first of all, we've got confidence. Okay. So with your cloud technologies, you know, this this idea like we talked about with database scalability. Elastic load balancing, Amazon Elastic Cache, auto scaling, all those things are huge to us. But one of the big things that we really like is this idea of, of repeatable environments. We can have a beta, we can have a stage, we can have a production, we can even create some edge location that we want to say, hey, we're going to try some new things out and give it to, you know, show it to 10% of our traffic, something like that. You have this ability to build these environments pretty quickly. And this becomes really important when you're talking about global, you know, scalability. I need this exact architecture, but in a different region. So we've got it in Sydney, Australia right now, uh, but let's say we need one in EMEA or in the US or uh, you know, Asia Pacific or you know, any one of them. Then we can use those cloud formation templates with different parameters and up we go. So we're not having to provision and build all that out. We can scale very quickly. All right. So continue with confidence. Um, Managed service provider brought them a ton of confidence. Number one, they liked that the service provider that works as a partner. They liked that we had a database guy sitting in their office. They liked that we could come in and say, look, we have the expertise. Let me point out some things. And that, again, that goes into the deep expertise. The 24-7 presence, that's huge. You know what I mean? So what you've got are experts in, in this technology. Because the reality is, even on AWS, and, and Diego may, may shut me down or mute me here, but even on AWS, things break things go down, right? That's the reality of the industry we're in. Uh, Werner Vogel said, everything breaks. I don't think I got the exact, but that's a paraphrase, everything breaks. And so you have to plan for that. And, and by building a highly available architecture, we do that. But in that off case, you know, where it doesn't, we, you know, Rackspace are, the, are, your, are your abstracted layer of, hey, we can handle that, we can help you out. So that 24 seven presence is critical. All right. The other thing they came out with was increased productivity. Uh, I mean, if, if you think about the way this works, they're able to say, you know, we no longer have to worry about managing our database. We don't know. We manage the data. And that's an important distinction, right? They manage the data, but they don't have to manage the database infrastructure. 
that takes a lot of load off them. Take that out to the Nginx, uh, you know, setup. They don't have to manage multiple Nginx boxes. And then there's, like I said, there's nothing wrong. Nginx is a powerful, powerful product, but it's dangerous in the tools. It's dangerous in the hands if you don't know exactly how to use it. And so by removing that management layer from them and saying, look, we'll handle the management of your application uh, load balancer through using a managed service like ALB, uh, which is part of the elastic load balancing family, then, then you know, we, we can take that out. And you don't have a bunch of boxes. You just have one point of management and it's done. So the predict productivity was hugely increased. Um, that also shine, you know, shows in, in, in Redis and different things like that. And so... By the end of the day, with confidence in what they're doing, confidence in how they're, uh, you know, and, and how they're being managed with Rackspace, confidence with their cloud technology in AWS, these guys get to sit down, they get to do their job. They get to do what they're good at, and that's payment processing. We're going to wrap up for today's webinar. And as a reminder, we are going to be, you're going to be receiving one email in the next two to three days with a link with the slides and the recordings of today's webinar. Uh, we want to thank you all very much for attending. So if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you and have a nice day.